Good day and welcome back to Entrepreneurial Ed with me, Tanya Habimana. Over the past few episodes, we have spoken to an innovator, a venture capitalist and a mining giant. All these entrepreneurs have one thing in common, and that is that they are expanding their ideas across border. My next guest today is no different. He is a Ghanaian born advisor to governments, investors and leading multinational companies on navigating and expanding in emerging markets. Isaac Kwaku Fokuo Jr. founded the Butu Emerging Markets Group in 2006, a firm with a track record in investment facilitation, strategy consulting and policy advisory across sectors including finance, technology, healthcare, education and more. In 2014, he was honored as an Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellow. He became a trustee of Hanover College and was appointed as an advisor to the China Africa Tech Initiative. Isaac also co-founded the Sino-Africa Center for Excellence, a non-profit research center promoting the exchange of knowledge, ideas and experiences between China and Africa. He also co-founded the Amahoro Coalition, an initiative convening private sector firms in Africa to accelerate the economic inclusion of refugees. Welcome Isaac Kwaku Fokuo Jr., founder and principal of Butu Emerging Markets Group. Isaac, you have a, such a diverse and intriguing background from international relations to angel investing, cross-national business collaborations between China and Africa, but also with the Middle East. And you've done work with refugees within healthcare, wildlife conservation, and the list goes on. I have to ask you, when it comes to business and your career, what was your first love? Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, lovely to be here uh, to talk to you. Uh, when it comes to business, what did my first love? I don't know that I have a first love. I think that um, my mom also always used to say that I act like I have ants in my pants. I, I sort of seem to like doing many things at the same time. Um, but I think perhaps one thing that's consistent with everything I've done so far is that there is a ridiculous passion for the African continent. And I think that's been with me since I was a child. And everything that I do, everything that I touch, has to have a direct bearing on Africa and also have a direct impact on people and people's lives. So I think that is probably what I will say the, the, the two merge, and that would be where my love sits. That's most, most certainly is being felt in all of your activities. But where did you get started? So I, that's an interesting question. I, most of my peers that I know are very clear. You know, I have friends who tell you, you know, they have this plan and they have that plan and had that plan. The truth is, I didn't really have a plan in that, in that sense. I mean, I grew up in Ghana, as you mentioned. Um, and at some point, where I moved to the U.S. Uh, with my parents. Um, and then I went to school, started working. And I never really, you know, I never really thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I think I became an entrepreneur on accident, if I'm, if, if, if I'm being honest. And I think that... Um, I think the starting point for me was when I started realizing, I started connecting the dots between that which I'd studied and um, also looking at the lives of people that I knew on the African continent, especially, and this desire to say, okay, what can I do to make my difference, right? What can I do to make sure that I build an ecosystem or I work with others to build an ecosystem to make, um, to make things different in different ways, whether it's in life for people, whether it's in the way governments make policy, uh, whether it's in, you know, advising companies to come to the continent to continent to work, because ultimately uh, the biggest instructor for me was that we need to find ways to get Africans jobs and everything I can do to make sure that I play my part in the role, I am going to do so. Uh, so I think the, the starting point was basically, I guess, right after university. Um, I started going to these conferences on Africa uh, at, at Boston and a few other places and got hooked on the Africa journey story. So in a way, an, an accidental entrepreneur, that's something we don't hear quite often. I want to just reflect a little bit, um, looking at your, your um, story so far, what would you say is um, the number one lesson that you've learned when it comes to entrepreneurship and moving forward in uncharted territory? A couple, actually, I'll give you more than one. I think the first thing for me is do not stick to the script. Uh, and I say this quite, quite intentionally, and I think a little bit this earlier. I, I've never been one to um, templatize things. I've not been one to say that this is, you know, this is a strategy, we're going to stick to it. I, we have broad strategies, and I have broad, I, broad, broad, things, broad ways of thinking about different things. But I think the, the first thing I'll say is that 
I've been lucky enough to be fortunate enough to lean into things when doors have been opened and it's worked out for me. Uh, I think the second thing is also being that do not take yourself too seriously. Um, and a friend of mine says all the time that what's a mind if you can't change it? Um, I'm never one to become overly dogmatic about an idea. And I'm always willing to listen to that person's idea to make sure that if the other idea is better than mine. And I think those two lessons have, have sort of played a very critical role in the way I think about this kind of thing, especially in markets that are uncharted. You know, I've worked in Sudan, I've worked in Somalia, I've worked in the markets that are quite, quite untraditional. And I think that those lessons in making sure that you keep, a, keep an open mind, look for the right opportunity, um, and lean in when doors open or lean in when the windows crack and, you know, break it open seems to be something that works well for me um, when, I, when I conduct business, business in, those, in those spaces. And what market was uh, the untraditional market that you first went into? I think we had the most, the most interesting market I've entered was Sudan. I, we started working in Khartoum a couple of years ago. This was right after the separation between the North and the South. Um, and we, we, had, we had a partner in Khartoum, we started working in Sudan. And I'd never, I'd never worked in, um, first of all, I've never worked in East Africa before until then. And second of all, the whole, of Africa, the whole region was fairly new to me. And I think that working in a country at the time that, you know, this was when Bashir was the president, um, you know, uh, the government was trying to privatize, but not really. Um, there was a lot of donor aid going in there, and, and they just came out of conflict. So there were a lot of variables that were going on at the same time. And again, the question for me was very simple. is okay, how do you make the life of people better? How do you find economic output, which is, which is important? How do you make money in this economy? But also, more importantly, how do we find ways to make sure that the work we're doing on the ground actually has a real impact? And navigating those waters and understanding the nuances uh, when it comes to working in, territory, in countries like that uh, for me, we're very, we're, we're very instructive. Uh, for instance, you know, you know, we, you know, you, you go to school, you go to business school, you learn how to do business, you learn how to, how to do a, drop at a PNL, and then you go to a market where you have to throw some of those things, those things out the window, and contextualize those things that you learned in the, in the way that is, that is, that allows for local context to make sense. Now, these are things you're told, but having the theory and having the practice of that, of the conversation, for me, was, was very eye opening, and I learned quite a bit uh, from, from that experience. And if you, if you had to um, do things differently, so if you had to start from a different place, what, what would you do differently? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Look, I, I, think, I, I think that, you know, I think life is funny like that, right? I think we all have, you know, again, people, people have do-overs. People have times in life where they say, well, if I was to do this over again. For me, again, as I alluded to earlier, most of my professional life, and even personal life to a large extent, have been quite accidental. And I say accidental in that they were not things I planned. And I've been very, very conscious and open to what the universe brings my way. And so, have the, you know, there have been situations or, situ situations or scenarios where one could say, well, you know, if I was to do it over again, I'll do this different, I'll do this different. Well, I believe that the only way I'd get to where I am, the, the only way I've been able to arrive to where I'm right now has been because I went through that, I went through the journey. I mean, you know, the, it's, Life, work, everything that we do is about the journey, not the destination. And I do not know what the destination is. I do not know what the next thing is for me. I, I honestly don't. What I do know is that I have a burning desire to keep breaking boundaries, keep disrupting conversations if possible, um, but then take every lesson that I learn or everything that I do as a step toward the next venture. And for me, that's good enough. So I will not change anything that, that, that I've done uh, and do it over again. I'll, I'll do the same thing if given the same opportunity. I really like what you're saying, Isaac, because that really speaks to firstly letting things happen in almost like a flow and accepting opportunities as they come and leveraging them. But it also speaks to a certain confidence in your or your ability to be able to use these opportunities and move forward. Um, now, we've had these conversations with a few entrepreneurs already. And one thing that keeps coming up and that I want to ask you is, um, Who's in, your, who's in your circle? How have you um, moved along this journey? And who has maybe helped you or handed you a, a helping hand? You know, you know, that's an interesting question. I was listening to some of the past episodes and yes, almost all your guests have very specific names and people who have, but the truth is, I, I cannot say that they are specific people who've helped me in specific ways. What I can say, is that I've been inspired by different people and what they do. And this is why I say that. I say that not because I'm an expert in what I do. I say that because the journey I've taken, the path I've taken has been quite untraditional, right? Um, I, have, I, have, I have built a business. I have done venture capital, I've done engine investing. I have set up an NGO. These are things that are not, at, at surface level, are not, are not related. 
But somewhere in there, for me, there's a common thread. And so what I, what I do do is I do look at folks in different spaces that are doing things that I, I find very instructional. I'll give you an example, actually. Let, let me give you one name. There's a guy by the name of John Thornton, John L. Thornton. John Thornton uh, was very instrumental. He, he's at the Brooklyn Institute. Very instrumental in cementing the sort of U.S.-China relations. Some of my China-Africa conversations and think, the way I think of China-Africa comes from what John Thornton did. Right, this idea that people matter, this idea that, you know, uh, I believe John was very influential in getting, you know, young American students to do things that they brought in China and things of that nature. And so when I started working on China Africa, the first thing I did was to launch an internship program. And the internship program I launched wasn't to send Africans to China to study, uh, to do internships. The internship program did the reverse. We were bringing young Chinese, young smart Chinese students or gap year students to African companies to learn about Africa. Right. And again, so that, you know, looking at what John did was very instructional for me. Looking at the way we got Boto in terms of thought leadership, I've been influenced a bit by what Brookings Institute does, right? Um, I've also been influenced a little bit by some of the work that some of the big four, some of the work BCJ does, some of the work McKinsey does, um, and then Frontier Advisory, a company that was in South Africa. So I'm influenced by some of these organizations and what they do. But I think in terms of, and people within them that, that I know and respect, but I think in terms of the, 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 um, the, the masala that is built, I think some of that I kind of make, make up as I go along, <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> I, I, I really like what you're saying. And um, one thing that I want to go back to is the, the notion of not taking yourself too seriously. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs, um, when they get started, they, they're very much in a hurry, in a hurry to get the business plan going, to get the business cards, to get the office, to make sure that they're known. Um, and and it feels to me like you've actually done quite the opposite, where you've actually just moved forward bit by bit and been able to take in the opportunities as they go. Um, now, listening to, to you, the other thing that I, I do that, that does come to mind is the fact that um, there are several things that you care about, a lot of causes. And one that uh, struck me quite particularly is your involvement with the Boardroom Africa, which is basically um, a, an organization that is involved in bringing uh, gender parity and representation in the boardroom and helping uh, uh, female CEOs um, make their, their ways toward boardrooms. Now, why did you get involved in this cause and what does it mean to you? Yeah, no, thanks for that. If I may step back for a second. So I, I think I'm perhaps one of the few entrepreneurs you're going to talk to who isn't necessarily motivated by money. <laughs> and I say that, and I think, and I think because of that, because money isn't, isn't always the first driver for the things I do, I think it allows me to play the long game. And again, I'm not saying one is good or one is bad. That's just the way I've been, I've been fortunate to, to live my life. And so I believe that when you set a course and you look at the long game, you're able to take deliberate steps and intentional steps to actually create an ecosystem play over time that serves you well. And this brings us to bottom Africa. Why, did I join, why do I care about the bottom Africa? Well, I care about the bottom Africa because women across the continent have not been given a fair shake in the, in, in, in the work they do. Um, my, again, back to my personal life, my, my entire professional life before I started my business, almost all my managers or directors were women, right? So I, I'm not one of these, I, for some reason, I come from a line of being mentored and being, being raised and, 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 and being, um, um, being managed by, by very successful women um, that I respect a lot. Um, and then also I think that because of that, uh, I have this, um, this in the desire to always, always make sure that women around me and women that I associate with are also getting the face shake to make sure that they are represented well in, in the boardroom, in companies, whatever. And I think what Marcia is doing for the boardroom Africa was very attractive to me because, you know, a couple of reasons. One, we do need a diverse representation of boards across the con African continent. Most of our boards are made up of men who are typically very old, who are typically... Um, who are very smart, who, who've done their part, but I think in some cases they need to leave the space for others to take over uh, because the African continent is made up of a, lot, a bunch of young people and the young people, half, half, at least half of them are women. So it's only fair that if we can get to a point where at least half of our board members are women, I think that'd be a fair thing, that'd be a fair thing to have on the continent. I don't think that's too much to ask for. Um, and, and also secondly, you know, beyond the diversity, the diversity of that comes to the table, you know, diversity in thought matters, right? We all don't think the same. And so bringing, making sure that we're providing a platform that lifts up and celebrates women who are willing and able to serve these companies, it's a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Well, I go back to what I said earlier. One of the principal things you need to do as a continent is create jobs for young people. We all know the numbers. By 2050, you know, Africa doesn't have the youngest youth population that you give it. Well, 2050 is what, 28 years from now. It's going to be in our lifetime. And so the way we build to that, the way we build toward that is to make sure that every part and every facet of the corporate environment represents what Africa looks like. And women are a very integral part of that. 
So I'm very, I'm very bullish on what the, the work that Bottom of Africa is doing because I think it's one of those spaces where it allows us to provide the platform for women who are willing to serve on those boards. And when they get on these boards, they have a responsibility to make sure that the governance are done properly, the account, you know, the, the board governance is, 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 is done, is done, is, is done well, but also to make sure that their voices are represented and also to bring in more women and men into these companies to make sure that we create a more inclusive and prosperous continent over time. And I'm most certainly happy to, to hear that. So, that. so that's one of the causes that you're interested in. Now, you've just told us you're not necessarily motivated by money, um, but you did play a role in the investment spaces, angel investing. So then my question is, what makes you invest in a business? I invest in founders, not in a business. So, I mean, let me just be clear. I'm not motivated, but I do, I do like money. <laughs> money is a good thing, right? <laughs> um, let me be clear about that. What, what I meant to say was that, the, the idea comes before the, the idea comes before the money. Is what I was trying to say. Um, so why do I invest in business? I, I invest in founders. I believe that you know they, again there are many different types of investors across the water, across the continent, uh, and different investors have different criteria for people they invest in. My ethos tends to be that most of the investments I've made, I'd say about 75, 80 percent of them, have been in gender uh, uh, gender gender businesses, so women women run businesses, and then the other the 20, 25 percent haven't been. But even the 20, 25 percent there is a link to gender that has to do with the business the person is running, the, the individual is running. Um, why founders? I believe in founders because I think for, for, for you to start a business, right, I think it takes a certain level of, I mean, in, in my case, it was a bit of an accident, but for most people, I think it takes a certain level of not just confidence, but um, desire to, desire to, I guess, to build beyond yourself, desire to um, expand beyond your ecosystem. And I think you need all the support you can get. I like founders who are inclusive, I like founders who, make, who think of ecosystem plays. I like founders who think beyond their respective countries. And I like founders, founders who are grounded, have integrity. And I don't mean integrity as in, you know, they're not corrupt or whatever. They're, they're going to make mistakes. But I, I admire founders who see themselves um, uh, as having a place within this African continent and doing their part to create the continent that I, I want to see and that they want to see, that their children want to enjoy. And so when I meet someone like that, when I meet someone whose journey uh, whose journey appeals to me. And there's also, I have a special spot for, for founders who are not, I don't know how to say this, who are not um, necessarily clean cut, right? They, they, they've, they know how to hustle. They're very bright, they know how to hustle. They know how to, um, they understand what it's like to be in the shoes of an average African human, an average African person. Um, that speaks to my heart because that's the kind of person that I, I, I am. And so I think that those types of funders are, 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 are attracted to them, and I, I tend to invest in those types of businesses. How do you feel about um, how do you feel about founders that are on a second, a third, maybe a fourth business, and that have failed in the past? I think it's beautiful. Look, this idea of resilience. Huh? This idea of resilience is, is, is awesome. Can you imagine? <laughs> you feel first time, feel second time. Your parents are like, "What are you doing? Go get a job at GE. Go do this. Go do this." And you keep at it. And especially, you know, sometimes, you know, what's interesting is that some of these funders we're talking about, right? They could be doing something else, right? They could they could get a job somewhere and get a nine to five and and, and, and do something else. I, I I know I know one person. And I'll give an example of this, right? One one of our, one of our companies. This young man, well, this man, he's not young, he's not so young, um, had a corporate job, ran a venture capital wing of a very large, um, you know, very large multinational company, quit that company and started a business. Now, the first business was sort of at his knees and whatever, but he kept at it. And I think this idea of keeping at something and having the resilience to wake up every single morning with this vision that I am determined to make this happen, I think it's wonderful. And I think at the end of the day, even if you don't end up building a multi-billion dollar company or whatever it is, the lessons you take from that and the lessons you take to the next venture as a co-CEO, as a co-founder, as a, as a director in a different company, I think it's so instructive, right? And I think even that journey by itself is worth it. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's fantastic. And I think that that journey of resilience is something that we need to celebrate over and over again. Have you experienced failure? Of course, who hasn't? Of course I have, yeah. I, but, but, you know, again, it, it's another day in the shop, right? I mean, they, I, I, they've been, I'll give you a quick example. That we, so I moved to Nairobi um, from Chicago in 2010, uh, I believe 2010. And, you know, I, I came into Kenya and I had a plan, quite a plan. I had investors lined up. We're going to do A, B, C, D. We're going to, you know, conquer the world, whatever. Well, 2010 was just after the financial crisis. And so we've been negotiating with some of these investors. 
before, you know, during the whole crisis thing. And I moved on faith, right? Well, half of the stuff we wanted to do didn't work out. I could have stayed in Chicago. It was quite comfortable. <laughs> it was quite comfortable. And it kind of sucked for a while, right? It, and, and, and it gives you humble pie. And I think that the humble pie is very good for your growth. And I know it's, it's good for stretch. Um, it's good for you to rethink. It's good for you to re, re, realign the things you care about. I, I don't know that I'll be sitting here in Dubai talking to you if the plan I had at the time had gone the way it was supposed to go, right? These things happen, and the cliche, the cliche goes without saying, things happen for a reason, and it's true. You are going to face these challenges. You are going to face these, you know, uh, these blocks. But it's not about the blocks. It's about how do you bounce off of it, right, and, and what you do with it. And sometimes you're going to be there for a while and for a long time. And it's also okay because eventually you're going to get up. The, you know, the, the sun comes out again, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's encouraging to hear. But talk to us about Dubai. Um, what, what brought you to Dubai? Pure accidents, I'll tell you. I, I was flying through Dubai. I was flying, um, I believe it was March 2017, uh, something like that. And I was in the lounge uh, and I read an article about Dubai, Africa. And I said, I got very curious. I've been coming to Dubai for a while, right? And, you know, I come to Dubai, I do business, I go. But I've never looked at Dubai within the context of what, what first of all, the, the UAE represents and what, how Dubai as a city sits in the context of the African continent. Let me explain that. A lot of us who are in this space, when we think of investment, we think of even geopolitics, think of whatever, we think of what are called the big powers. We think of the US, we think of the UK, we think of whatever. Dubai is four hours from Nairobi, three and a half hours from Addis Ababa, if I'm not mistaken. The UAE happens to be one of the top five investors into the African continent. At last check, I believe as of 2019, 2020, I'm not sure what the numbers look like right now, two of the top five invest, invest, uh, investors to Africa were the UAE and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I'm asking myself, I live in Nairobi. I'm living in Nairobi and Dubai is four hours away, four hours away. I need to learn about this place. I need to learn what's happening here. What does the, why are they so interested in investing into Africa? Where does Dubai sit into this, in, within this whole uh, Africa construct? That was it. And then a few months later, I was in Dubai. <laughs> and, so, and so I moved for a couple of reasons. And, that was, that was one, and the other reason was that I wanted to understand uh, how one could build a practice that sort of helps create what I call the new emerging economy or the new global economy, um, looking at a trilateral relationship between the African continent, the UAE, say China, and maybe even India, the Quad, right? Because where Dubai sits, relative to the continent, more and more multinationals, even African companies, are using Dubai as, as their hub. And, and that means something. And why is that? Well, because the conditions here make sense. Why is that? Because the government here creates an environment where it's easy to do business. Why is that? Because it's close, it's, it's close enough to us. The Red Sea is right where it, 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 you know, um, it's not, not too far from here. The Gulf of Eden is not, not, not too far from here. So that's why I moved to Dubai. And I think my role here and what I'm, what I'm doing here essentially is finding ways to catalyze the conversation to understand and build a practice around how do we engage uh, partners in this region, but also partners beyond this region using Dubai as a connector to the African continent in different ways. Okay, that's interesting. And um, what about Dubai? Or let, let me rephrase my question. Was there anything about Dubai that surprised you once you got there? Yes, many. But I'd say, so I think one of the things that just surprised me about Dubai when I moved here was the willingness of government to listen. And I say that intentionally, right? So, you know, I, I belong to a few organizations here um, and every once in a while we'll get a note saying, hey, the government is interested in hearing what private sector thinks about ABCD. The government is interested in what, what private sector take on blah, blah, blah. Um, the government's interested in what African, African businesses think about, you know, last Earlier this year, I received a call from a very prominent government minister asking my thoughts on Africa and what they should be doing differently in Africa. Now, I'm an African man. No one from my government has ever called me to ask me anything about my team, how they think about Africa. And, and, and I, mentioned that, I mentioned that for a reason, jokes aside, is that when a government is willing to listen to its people, when a government listens to its constituency, and they change, and they move, and they modify, and they build, and they create, and they co-create with you, that's magic. And I think that's one thing Dubai has going for it, right? And I think that, that magic happens because of the willingness to listen to the private sector, mm. to listen to civil society. And I think that for me was a very big surprise because when I moved here, I was always a monarchy, da da da. But it's not, right? I think they, they, it's, I mean, it is a monarchy, but it's not, right? But it's, I think it's one of those things where um, government listens to people. I think government is willing to uh, create conditions for success. Um, I think the visa regime allows people to move in and out very easily, which is fantastic. 
we live in a continent in Africa where visas are still a problem. More Africans struggle to give visas to other African countries mm -hmm. than non-Africans. That needs to stop, right? And I think that when you live here and you want to visit Dubai, you, you get a visa within 24 hours, and it's okay. It facilitates movements of people. The more I go to a place to visit, the more I go to Accra, I go to Vinhook, I go to I go to Francistown, Botswana, Botswana. The more I visit, the more willing I want to invest in your country. The more I like your people. If you make it difficult for me to visit your country, I'm never going to invest. And Dubai has been successful partially, I think, because of its willingness to open its doors to to all, everyone to come and do business, to come and visit, to come and to come and, to come and have vacation, to come for medical care. Whatever it is you want to do, you can come do here. And I think it's a wonderful thing they've done. That's such an interesting point that you raised there about how um, initial entry point and going into a country is what, what is the, the first point um, that makes a person want to invest or do business there. Um, and, and touching back on something that you talked about earlier on and how you, you care about and are invested in raising the next generation and about youth and job creation, I want to ask you, um, from your perspective, what needs to happen on the African continent to create an environment that is enabling for the young uh, next generation of entrepreneurs? A, a couple of things, but I think, first of all, back to what I was saying about Dubai, we need to listen more. Right? We, we tend to have this mentality that young people are just young and experienced. But in most parts of the world, young people are the drivers of industry, right? We, you see entrepreneurs who are in their 20s and 30s and you know, doing amazing, amazing things. Um, I think, so first of all, I think, we, I think we need to listen more. I think we need to listen to people, young, young people, um, with their ideas and what they bring to the table. But I also do think that we do need to create, and I think you're seeing this, we're seeing this more and more in a, a lot of African countries where go our governments are getting much better at creating that enabled environment. When in our business, we do quite a bit of market entry work, right? We do a lot of market entry work from Gulf to Africa, you know, Europe to Africa, whatever, those kinds of, those kinds of things. And when we evaluate the country and we, and we do the risk assessment, we, sort of, we, we, we build a rubric around where we think the company should go, how they should invest. One of the things that we look at beyond anything else is the social environment of the country, right? And what I explained to you earlier, would I want to visit this place? Is there a place I can put a manager? Is there a place I can put a director? Why do I care about that? What does it have to do with you? Well, when I live in a city where there are opportunities for young people to work, they can work at a, at a, at a, at a coffee house. They can start their own business doing, you know, I don't know, uh, something, something on FinTech. They can, they can be in the hospitality industry. When you create that opportunity for young people to create jobs for themselves and or work for others, I think it also pulls other people in. So I think that one, we can also create environments where it's easier to start these businesses. It's one thing to say you can start a business in six hours or 10 hours or two days or three days in the country. But then, then what? Do I have access to a small loan? Do I have access to you know, an incubator to, to work in? Are the banks willing to work with young people to, to, to give them short-term loans to, to, to do their work? Are governments willing to create venture, venture funds to facilitate some of these endeavors? to make sure that they take the first loss on the business. Um, it's a private sector, the more mature private sector in companies in the country willing to be, um, you know, the facilitators of business and trade with, the, with, with these young businesses. And I think the more we do that, the more we're going to be able to realize some of the things that we're talking about. Uh, and then on the back end of that, so transforming part of our education system, right? Allowing our young people to make sure that they get education that matters. There's no point of being educated if I'm being educated and I can't get a job when I'm done, right? Well, what do I do with that degree? How, how do I measure my success? And I think, again, some governments are doing it, some countries are doing it, but we need this catalytic, catalytic effect to make sure that thing catches fire across the continent. Some very strong points there, Isaac. Thank you so much for joining us today. That is where we'll have to leave this conversation. Thank you to my guest, Isaac Kwaku Fokuo Jr., founder and principal of Butu Emerging Markets Group. And to my audience, it's goodbye for now.